Ngayon po, nandito na sa harap natin si Apollo Kiboloy. Pilit na iniwasan ang Senado kung ano-anong kondisyones ang ginawa para hindi harapin ang ating pagdinig. 50 security personnel, private jet, five-star hotel, at iba pa. Pinarali pa ang mga tagasunod at binuli ang mga witnesses namin sa social media. Ngayon po, nandito na po kayo. Bumabagyo man, ay magkaharap na po tayong lahat. Today, Mr. Kiboloy, your victims will confront whom they believe to be their abuser. Wag po kayong mag-alala. You will also be given an opportunity to reply. Today, mga kasama, dear colleagues, sama-sama tayong matututo. Maglalago, magwawasto, at pinakamahalaga, maghihilom. We will all heal. At this point, um, pagdating po ni Majority Leader, Um, mag-opening mag statement din sila. At sa ngayon, may I request our committee secretary to recognize the resource persons and administer the oath to those who are here for the first time. At ganito po ang ating daloy, ladies and gentlemen. Today is about the victim survivors. Matagal nang pinatahimik, matagal na tinakot. Ngayon po ay bibigyan natin sila ng puwang magsalita. Mayroon din po tayo mga witnesses dito na minsan nang nagpakita sa ating hearing. Para sa kanilang kaligtasan ay gumamit po sila ng ibang pangalan. Kung ano-ano ang nadinig galing sa mga taga KOJC, kesyo daw, duwag, ayaw magpakita ng mukha. Ngayon po, magpapakita na ng mukha at buong pagkakilanlan, sina Yulia Tartova, na kilalang alias Sofia, Edward Ablaza Masayon, na kilalang alias Jackson, at Joar Martinet Olimba, na kilalang alias Jerome. So, Comsec, uh, pakikilalanin muna yung ating resource persons at panumpain yung hindi pa nakapagsumpa. Uh, May I request all of those who have not yet taken their oaths, resource persons and witnesses as well, to stand up. And please raise your right hand. Resource persons and witnesses, do you swear to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth in this Senate inquiry proceedings? Yes. Senator, they have all uh, answered in the affirmative. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Comsec, at maraming salamat sa lahat ng uh, resource persons. At this point, uh, bago natin unang binigin yung ating mga victim survivors, First, I would like to call on the Majority Leader, Senator Francis Tolentino, para sa kanilang opening statement. You have the floor, Majo. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Magandang umaga sa, sa ating mga resource persons. Magandang umaga kay uh, Pastor Apollo Kibuloy at sa lahat ng mga naririto. At sa mga kapwa kong mambabatas, kahit po yung nandun sa online at sa ating mga panauhin, tayo po ay naririto sa harap ng uh, committee ito sa isang maulang araw at nais ko lang linawin po ang uh, layunin para sa aking perspective as an officer of the court, as a lawyer, kung ano po ang layunit at kahalagahan ng pagdinig na ito. Ang Senado ay, una-una, ang Senado ay hindi isang hukuman at hindi po tayo naririto upang magpasya kung ang isang tao ay nagkasala o walang sala. Sa ilalim ng saligang batas ng Pilipinas, Lalong-lalo na sa Article 6, Section 21, binigyan tayo ng kapangyarihan. Tinutukoy ko po ang mga mambabatas na magsagawa ng mga investigasyon in aid of legislation o bilang tulong sa paggawa ng mga batas. Sa hukuman, ang pangunahing layunin ay ang paglutas ng mga kaso. 
at pag-alam kung may pananagutan o wala ang mga akusado. Batay sa ebidensyang ipinapakita sa Senado, ang ating layunin na iba. Ito ay upang mag-imbestiga at mangalap ng mga impormasyon at dokumento para sa isang ma makatarungan at makabuluhang pagbalangkas ng mga batas. Sa isang, sa isang usgado, meron, po, meron pong tinatawag na uh, right cross-examine witnesses. Uh, maliwanag po sa rules of court, ang Bill of Rights, at iba pa. Ngunit nais ko pong ipabatid na ang karapatang mag-cross-examine ng mga testigo, isang mahalagang bahagi ng mga pagdinig ng korte, ay hindi saklaw ng investigasyon ito. Ang proseso ng cross-examination at iba pang pamamaraan na ginagamit ng korte ay, ay eksklusibo sa hudikatura. Marami salamat din po, Majority Leader. At uh, dagdag dun sa areas of legislation na tinukoy ng Majority Leader, inuulit ko lang yung bahagi ng opening statement ko rin kanina tungkol sa ating mga batas kaugnay ng uh, pag-misuse ng usapin ng religious freedom, yung mga rape laws natin, kung na sasaklaw na nito yung mga usapin ng consent, sexual agency, at religious freedom, at yung mga labor laws din natin, kung saklaw yung mga uh, karapatan at kagalingan ng mga tinatawag na religious volunteers. So muli, salamat po sa majority leader. And at this point, uh, lastly, bago natin pakinggan yung ating mga victim survivors, uh, may request po sa ating good uh, Foreign Affairs Secretary Manalo dahil kinakailangan nilang umalis ng mas maaga uh, na makapagbigay ng ilang mga uh, salita sa atin. Secretary Manalo, uh, you have the floor, uh, sir. Thank you. Maraming salamat, uh, Honorable Chairperson Senator Risa Antiveros, uh, Honorable Senator Francis Tolentino, uh, my colleagues in government, good morning. Um, I just want to thank Senator Antiveros and this committee for giving the Department of Foreign Affairs the opportunity to contribute to our um, meeting today in aid of uh, legislation. Um, nice ko lang mag uh, briefing lang on two points uh, with your permission. The first point is on the, the, the possible extradition uh, issue. And uh, as you know, the Philippines has an extradition treaty with the United States of America. I wish to report that as of this date, the Department of Foreign Affairs has not received a formal uh, extradition request from the United States. Dun po sa isang issue then, uh, I want to um, focus on the request for assistance by any Filipino nationals in the United States who may have been victims of uh, human trafficking in relation to this case. Uh, as of this date, none of our foreign service posts in the United States have reported receiving any request for assistance. Madam Chair, uh, the DFA is ready to assist in providing any information that we may receive from this date relevant to, the, uh, to today's legislative inquiry. And uh, I have also, um, I'm also being joined today by Under Secretary Jesus Domingo, who can uh, add uh, any input if needed for uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Manalo. Yes, uh, would you, Sec Domingo, like to briefly add anything to these two updates uh, on the uh, formal request for extradition and the request for assistance? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, Senator uh, Tolentino. Yes, as um, Secretary Manalo had, has uh, mentioned, that uh, we have not yet received a formal request, but we are standing by uh, also, uh, we have also not re received any requests re regard to um, trafficking, uh, sorry, with assistance with respect to the human trafficking. But all our Foreign Service posts and all our offices in the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, stand ready. And we have been in informal um, consultation and communications with our sister agencies and government. Thank you, Madam. Thank you also, uh, Yusek uh, Domingo. The majority leader would uh, like yes, to interject. One quick uh, follow-up question uh, address either the Secretary Manalo or uh, Yusek uh, Domingo. I have here in my possession in front of me our extradition treaty uh, signed November 13, 1994, which I believe should be read alongside Presidential Decree 1069. This has uh, 
some uh, legal complexities involved, and perhaps you might want to uh, educate this committee, which would have primacy just in case an extradition request is sent to the DFA, what would happen to the pending case cases uh, lodged before the Regional Trial Court of uh, Pasig pursuant to PD 1069. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Manalo. Yeah. Uh, if I could first give a very general answer, and then, of course, uh, uh, on any specifics uh, that might arise in the event that we receive a formal extradition request. Just to say, uh, if we do receive a formal request, we will, uh, the DFA will, of course, study it and see if it is consistent with the agreed procedure pertaining to extradition. And here is where PD uh, uh, 1069 would also come in. So we would have to study that. And then after, if we are satisfied with the request, uh, we will, of course, refer it to the uh, Department of Justice for, for relevant action. So in other words, um, we will still have to study any extradition request uh, if received. Um, perhaps uh, later, it's a quite a detailed approach, but a young general approach uh, if we do receive uh, such a request. Thank you. One quick follow-up, uh, just to remind the officials of Department of Foreign Affairs, as well as uh, councils present here. Anything that would transpire and would come out of these proceedings would, under oath would be recorded. And pursuant to existing extradition rules, any request to have any transcripts coming out of these proceedings would have to be coursed through the DFA. Kayo po ang magpapadala nito mula sa committing ito papunta kung saan man. So you should be aware of that and the same, the, say, the, the lawyers here present should be aware of that because this would, this would uh, uh, trigger some concerns involving involving civil rights or individual rights so just be aware of that uh, and and i i suggest madam chair that the dfa should should uh, stay here till the conclusion of the the investigation proceedings uh, to be to be physically present what uh, but that's what i'm saying thank you madam chair Thank you, Majority Leader. Uh, assured naman po tayo na bagamat uh, met mea kailangang mauna ng umalis si Secretary Manalo that you, Sec Domingo, uh, will stay on with us. So the department will be uh, uh, well represented. Salamat po, uh, Secretary Manalo, uh, Under Secretary Domingo at uh, Majority Leader. So ngayon po, ang una po nating witness uh, ngayong umaga ay si Teresita Valdehuesa ang diumanong miyembro ng unang batch ng pastoral ni Apollo Kiboloy. Bago po siya magsimula, I would like everyone to listen to this video, to watch this video. Si Ms. Teresita, si Ms. Ging, ang pinapatungkulan dito, but it will also give a sense of the threats that victim survivors face uh, from within the kingdom. Uh, open source po itong uh, video na ito. In fact, uh, galing sa public channel uh, ni Pastor dati. So, ipe-play na po natin ngayon para mapanood natin lahat. She contacted someone named Teresita Valdehuesa who was a former worker here in the kingdom who committed lapses of fornication with many, many ministers and men. That is why she was supposed to be disciplined, but she went out. This, this Alina Ostapchenko is saying things against me, and we were able to do record every bit of what she said. Listen to her voice. Everything that you have said to Teresita Valdehuesa, who is a former worker here, who also backslid because of some lapses in immorality, will give you a sample of her voice that was recorded. Go. I'm fine, dear. I remember you, Bayo. And um, 
I'm so glad that I already out of the kingdom and um, it's a miracle that how I exit from there because the time kasi I was so fanatic before but when um, you know time passed I realized many things I can also share with you if you like ask me if I'm ready to dedicate my life I said yes because I you know for me I was thinking dedicate to God so I never think about other stuff and suddenly he was on me already and he's he was trying to pull my pants already off and then things started to happen and I understand that oh my goodness it's like I have to know like, switch off my mind I will not question I will not ask if, if it's father's will in, in my mind <laughs> the time I will just said I will just um, ano lang, not try not to feel anything like that and because I was shocked by what's happening in the room you have to prove that in court because this is an international ministry and I have an international reputation you will be sued by the kingdom in all places that you've called we will not let this pass Teresitable de Wesa will be part of this so better get your lawyers and defend yourself we have lawyers all over the world, wherever there is a kingdom. We have a general counsel in the name of uh, Attorney Michael Green. In America, we have 18 lawyers who are observing all the happenings in the kingdom. We have financial consultants. We have uh, lawyers who will defend the kingdom wherever it is being attacked. For the record, po, yung pastoral na binanggit dito si Ms. Alina, she gave her consent also to the playing of this video uh, in this hearing. So, Ms. Teresita, uh, meron po kayong uh, testimonyang hinanda. Uh, pwede nyo na pong basahin. You have the floor. Good morning po, Madam Chair, Honorable Senator Riza Honteveros, and to Honorable Senator Francisco Tolentino, and all the members of this August body. I come here today to share the truth that has been silenced for three decades because of great fear. And this is also on behalf of the many victims who have suffered in silence just like I have. I believe my testimony reflects their pain, struggles, and resilience. While I understand that this is aimed to aid in legislation, I am also grateful to be given this opportunity to inform those who still believe that Apollo Kiboloi has been innocent of the crimes he is accused of because he has never been. At the age of 17, I became a member of the church led by this man, Apollo Kiboloi, in 1918. I was a freshman student. I was eager and active in the community, even spending a significant portion of my college years living at the parsonage where he resided. In 1988, I made a difficult decision of my life to dedicate this to his ministry, driven by the belief that true fulfillment and salvation lay in serving God fully. This choice meant leaving behind my family, my career, and the persons and the person I once was. Despite the resistance of family and friends, I pursued my conviction. I joined a pioneering group that struggled to meet basic needs, but my desire to serve God fueled my persistence. Over time, I gained his trust and became a respected worker within the ministry. As the ministry grew, so did our blessings. We experienced answered prayers and expanding membership, which deepened our commitment to serving God. Apollo C. Kibuloy, whom I revered, was considered as God unwinted, and his words held absolute authority. I respected him deeply, viewing him as truly the man of God. From the moment I dedicated my life to the ministry until 1993, I experienced a profound spiritual awakenings. I felt forgiven. My love for God deepened. And I was proud to serve alongside a man I believed to be holy. But one day while in Manila, I received a long-distance call from him. He informed me that he had received a divine revelation intended for me and instructed me to travel to Cebu 
where he would share this important message. He was also scheduled to preach in Cebu that Sunday. Upon arriving in Cebu City, we arranged for him to stay at the Park Place Hotel in Fuente Osmeña. That evening, he instructed me to remain in the hotel while Lil Dalinda, the assigned worker, returned to the worker's house. When we were alone, I asked if I could just sleep on the sofa as it was a suite room. Instead, he insisted that I would sleep beside him and even sit in Bisaya, said in Bisaya, compatible gita ging kay parehas mo ng color ng atong suot. Translated, we are compatible because our outfits were of the same colors. I was wearing red pajamas with white dots while he was dressed in a red t-shirt and white pajama, white pants coincidentally. His words made me feel uneasy and quite nervous, and I saw a different personality in him, but I was quick to dismiss that unusual feeling. And because I had previously witnessed Ingrid Canada or ICC, Teresita Dandan, TTD, and Velina Salina slept in his room alternately, it led me to believe that it was just normal and harmless. Moreover, we had been conditioned to suppress any negative thoughts about him. We are warned, we were warned that any suspicion on him would reflect our own personality using the words found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, I quote, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted, unquote. And in those days, absolute obedience was a must. We needed to have an unquestioned loyalty and rever reverence toward him. Sleeping beside a man I believed to be chosen by God was for me then a great privilege, an opportunity for a sinner like me. But what followed shattered my sense of faith and trust. Without a word, after turning off the light, he embraced me and dressed me and violated me with his last one act and left me in shock and speechless. He then said, this is the fulfillment of God's revelation. He explained that God had revealed to him that I was to partake in God's life through him by surrendering my body soul and spirit he also mentioned that other girls would go through him in a similar manner his words were strange but i was too shocked to respond the following day after that sunday worship service apollo sik hibolo left for manila while i was left to carry on with my duties including organizing carolers for our, for our annual fundraising confusion consumed me i felt betrayed by my faith by him, and even perhaps by myself, I began questioning whether what had happened was indeed God's will or simply a gross abuse of power. When I returned to Manila, I was once again instructed to sleep in his room. Fear gripped me, but defying the anointing of God was unthinkable. We had been taught that such disobedience would invite a curse. The next morning, he asked if I understood God's revelation. I remained silent, unable to process what had happened. He then referenced me to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 12, explaining that just as Jesus humbled himself and obeyed God, even to the point of death, so he too must obey God's will by partaking in carnal things. He claimed this was necessary for him to understand the human experience and to fully empathize with others. He even told me that he, that he had also been reluctant to accept God's revelation, but as God's chosen one, he had no choice but to act on it. I was more confused with his explanation, but I could not complain. I wanted to go out from the ministry, but I lacked courage. I did not know where to ask help. I had cut all the bridges behind my life and I could hardly go back because it would mean starting all over again. My family was poor and I had no connections. My option was to stay because I was still bothered with what, what, if, it, what, if, what if it was indeed God's will. December of the same year was an escape for me. 
Caroling as one of our sources of funds, and which had been participated in by every member of the ministry all over the country, became my excuse of staying away from the workers' house in Manila where he stayed. In January 1994, I was in his room with Ingrid Canada, the international coordinator of the church, Tessie Dandan, the national administrator for the church in the Philippines, and Felina Salinas, his personal assistant. During that Ms. Teresita, before you continue po, yung nabanggit nyo ng dalawang beses, Ingrid Canada, nandito po ba siya sa harapan ninyo? Yes, patabi po siya ng ni Mr. Kipo. Sila po, yung nagtaas ng kamay. All right, salamat po. Please proceed, Ms. Teresita. During that meeting, he informed the girls that I would be included in the inner circle. Right there and then, I realized that these women had likely endured similar experiences. Without any words, we shared a mutual understanding. None of us dared speak about what had happened to us. In February 1994, I was sent to Hong Kong, still carrying all the confusions and emotional turmoil. Despite this, I continued to pretend that everything was fine. When one of our musicians, Jesse Pangilinan, was scheduled to return to the Philippines, I seized the opportunity to send a personal letter to ACQ. In that letter, I poured out my feelings, openly expressing my emotional distress. I was honest about how deeply shocked I was to learn of his life beyond the pulpit. The man I had revered as a holy figure was in reality an ordinary mortal, one who had exploited my genuine commitment and dedication to God. My faith wavered, and everything I had once believed was shattered. I prepared myself for a harsh response, expecting a violent reaction from him. To my surprise, there was none. Instead, I was sent back here. Upon my return, I was even more surprised to learn that I had been promoted. I was appointed National Crusade Coordinator, National Logistics Coordinator, and Luzon Area Administrator all at once. This was a sudden and significant promotion from my previous role. By God's grace, I excelled in all my assigned tasks. Despite this, fear gripped me every time Apollo Kiboloy would come to Manila. My only relief was when one of the girls would accompany him, giving me an excuse not to sleep with him. I kept myself busy, visiting satellite churches to distract my confusion and agony. One day, ICC confronted me saying, ACQ sensed my distance. I made my work an excuse. February 15, 1998, ACQ used me again. It was always out of fear that I obeyed, a fear mixed with anxiety that he might knew how I pretended to be extremely grateful that he allowed me to be a part of his physical life because in all, an, an, in all honesty and God truly knew, I was not. All the pent-up emotions suffocated me that on the following day, while preparing for church, I collapsed. ACQ performed mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but later I learned, he told others, that it was just a way for me to seduce him, labeling me as Jezebel the temptress. I believe Apollo Karyon Kibuloy understood that I never wanted the life he was trying to impose on me. My decision to dedicate my life to God's service was driven by a sincere desire for spiritual purification from the sins I had committed before becoming a full-time worker. I had only one goal, to live a holy life and ultimately to attain heaven. As the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, I quote, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust. But how could I achieve this with the circumstances that I was in? Disobedience and complaints were never an option. Anyone who did so was labeled as carnal, as someone who did not overcome the flesh. Everything was always twisted. One day, I said, Sir has noticed that you've been distant. I made up excuses trying to avoid the truth. 
I had been telling Tacey and Dan that I was extremely exhausted. She presumed that I was just too focused of my responsibilities, especially in the logistics department. I was always pressured to meet my 15 million quota. Every December on caroling season, if ever the sense that there was really something wrong with my belief, I was instructed to prepare my documents for you, my USA visa, and I believe realization came later when I already left from his group that it was also to distance me from the workers and members here that I might be able to tell his dark secret. I never wanted to go to America because inside of me were unresolved spiritual issues. Confused mind that bothered me always, always, but my visa was approved. I didn't know that I was to lead and plan for the fundraising to be done in America, and we would employ the same strategy of our money making here in the country. In America, I witnessed the double standard life. What we prohibited in the Philippines, we did them there. We lived in luxury, we toured around, we dined in fine and expensive restaurants, we watched movies. Sky's the limit when they went shopping. I decided to stay in the apartment where the minister and his family lived. Despite the insistence of ICC to stay with them, I refused. I made a lot of excuses. So, pagkat, hindi ko po natin na kami nasa Amerika ay masyadong nagpakasasa sa paggasta sa pera na masyadong pinaghirapan ng mga kapatiran at ng mga full-time workers. Bilang namuno po sa crusades, evangelism at logistics departments, saksi po ako kung paano nagsakripisyo ang bawat isa para lang makapagbigay sa iba't ibang pangangailangan sa simbahan. Nakita ko na kahit pambili ng bigas ng membro, kailangan ang sakripisyo pa para lang may bigay sa simbahan kahit gugutumin pa ang mga pamilya. Nasaksipan ko po na kahit last sintabo para pamasahi, kailangan ibigay pa rin, bahala ng maglakad, papuntang simbahan ang mga mahihirap na membro. Hindi kinaya ng aking konsensyang double standard life. Maraming workers ang napalo dahil sa panunood na ng sini, pero kami sa Amerika, halos linggo-linggo nanood ng sini, bawal sa amin ito dati. Naghirap ang maraming workers at members sa pagkaruling at pagsulisit sa bawat tao sa lahat ng dako dito sa ating bansa. May namatay, may naaksidente, may nakulong, may mga narate pa na hindi na nai-report. Dahil baka hindi pa niwalaan at baka makapagfasting pa dahil may kasalanan na itinago kaya napahintulutang nangyari. Lahat may kota, di ba? Napakasakit po sa damdamin ko dahil ako po ang namuno sa mga fundraisings. After December season, ang mga members kailangan magtinda na mga kakanin para may, may bigay sa mga pledges for Alay Kay Kristo, building funds, love offerings, television pledges, tithes and others, and when they could not provide for their own foods, they were just a sort of fasting. Meron din pa akong kota, 10 to 15 million pesos to raise in the month of December alone. I organized the carolers nationwide to meet my quota. We recruited and trafficked our young people from Mindanao and Visayas to carol in the provinces of Luzon and in the national capital region cities. Marami pong estudyante na Nobyembre pa lang kailangan ng mag-absent sa paralan at ang iba hindi na nakabalik sa pag-aaral Dahil inuna ang simbahan, inuna ang pagkaruling, inuna ang paghanap ng pera, but nobody questioned where our income was spent. Sa mabuwa ng Pebrero hanggang October, ang ibang workers na nasa logistics department, kailangan magsulisit na naman throughout the country using the permits of the different associations, pag-asa ng buhay, Children's Way Foundation, tulong sa may kapansanan, handog ng pagmamahal, pagdamay sa dukha, Shivers for Christ, the supposed income na dapat ibigay sa mga beneficiaries, sa mga nasabing associations, hindi naman talaga truthfully and honestly na ibigay. Only a little portion of the income was shared to the beneficiaries. Ang ibang workers naman, walang hinto sa pagtindarin ng mga kakanin na may kota 
of 500 to 1,000 pesos a day, Monday to Saturday. Ito ang buhay ng mga workers na nasa logistics department. In America, they began to notice, notice my indifference. ICC called my attention, stating there were reports from my assistant in the logistics department in Manila that I had secretly sent money to my family. Then she informed me that ministers wrote letters to ACQ and reported that I tempted and fornicated with them during my visits to their satellite churches. I was so shocked to learn the sudden accusations. I also wrote a letter and enumerated the real circumstances of my life with all the ministers I came in contact with in relation to our aggressive fundraising being the National Logistics Coordinator. However, that was not enough. I was then forced to write a long letter of confession, making it appear that I was a sinner who committed all kinds of sins, including those I had committed before joining the ministry. I complied, believing that through this written confession, I would be totally forgiven from my old sins and burdens and be completely sanctified in detail. I wrote everything I thought was considered sin I had committed from childhood until the present. I also implicated ACQ in my sins. It had the same tenor of the letter I wrote in Hong Kong in 1994. And this time, he was furious. Then ICC instructed me to revise my letter. I was told not to implicate ACQ and to state that I was the sole sinner and I was filthy. Upon realizing how angry ACQ was, I revised my letter out of fear and stated that I had sinned because I truly was filthy. In detail, I imagined sins. Ms. Teresita, yung paulit-ulit yung binabanggit na ICC, ICC, sino po yun? Ingrid Chavez, Canada. Sila pa rin po. All right. Uh, please proceed. In detail, I imagined sins and I made it appear that I had committed them all. That was how stupid I was to obey and exaggerate my story. Just to appease the anger of our leader, Apollo C. Kibuloy, not knowing it would become my death sentence later. My exaggerated story was then distributed to all his leaders and ministers, and they believed I was filthy, I was pervert, and I was wicked, painting me as the sole guilty party, while ACQ remained, remained innocent. Little did I know this confession would lead to my condemnation within the ministry. And Mr. Resita, pag sinasabi niyo ACQ, sino po yun? Kapulo, Karyon, Kibuloy po. Okay. October 15, 1998, I was sent back here to receive a punishment through prayer and fasting in the guise of spiritual discipline. And the fasting they planned for me was beyond my imagination. It took me seven months to suffer hunger and isolation in the mountain of Tamayong in Kalinan, Davao City. They placed me in a small, dark, elevated room beside a kitchen, separated only by a mac and walls. My bed was rough, made of uneven slabs, with exposed nails pressing into my back as I slept. I woke up this morning in pain, with no beatings, and the cold October nights left me shivering. I requested a blanket and a mat, but I was denied. Every day from 8 to 5 p.m., I followed a strict routine, regardless of the weather, enduring hunger and isolation. No one allowed near me, as I was labeled filthy and deserving of this punishment. Members were forbidden to speak to me. I was physically very weak and so depressed. depressed. I prayed that God would just take my life. Ilang beses po ako na nalangin na sana kunin na ako ng Panginoon. I started to question God and wondered if this was truly a divine process or simply human punishment. I asked myself 
Is this a secure way of retaliating because I rejected the life he imposed on me? It felt like vengeance and disguised as spiritual discipline. My only solace came from reading the word of God from Genesis to Revelation over and over again. Every day was a struggle of faith. I struggled to believe that the process was still the perfect will of God for me. I struggled to believe that I really was a sinner and that I was recuperating from my spiritual disease with a lack of faith. That was to justify my prison pains and at least, to at least lighten my burden of loneliness. On January 8, 1999, I gave ACQ a resignation letter and I requested for a fair so that I can travel back to my home in my province. He did not approve my resignation letter. I pleaded to Ingrid, and like a child, I cried for help, but she remained untouched, telling me that it was a divine process. After that conversation, Miss Iri doubled. I had no money, and I was still physically weak, so there was no way for me to go out from the compound of the prayer mountain. Waiting for the restoration is the only alternative at the moment. If not for the comforting words of God, surely, I would be totally gone out of my mind. They continually accused me of sins they alone knew and imagined that would always lead me into fasting. It eventually hardened my heart because I started to realize that the purpose of doing it was to totally break me down and to even slowly kill me. <laughs> I no longer saw the reason to stay. I submitted my resignation as a full-time volunteer worker for the second time. But Apollo Karyon Kibuloy refused it again. A week later, on September 30, 1999, I decided to leave without asking for permission determined to free myself from his control. It was only when I left of the group, out of the group that I fi finally clearly understood that the man I had believed to be God's chosen and holy was an impostor, oppressor, and deceiver. He manipulated me using his authority and power as God's anointed. I thank God that he took me out from his bandage, from that ambiguous feeling of fear mingled with so much love and loyalty to my Redeemer, Jesus Christ. But he was not finished with me and did not stop terrorizing me. Alex Kamia, his personal bodyguard, a full-time worker, once known to be a champion in gun shooting, before he joined the group of ACQ, together with his team, kept coming to my place to harass me, serving a fake warrant of arrest to a minister who stayed in my house. This minister settled in my place after he was gunned down in Davao City but survived. The team of Alice Kamiya was apprehended, and when investigated, they had several firearms in the car, several plate numbers, and there was also a red plate. The registered owner of the car was Apollo C. Kibuloy. Because of their failure to save the warrant of arrest, they blamed me for hiding the minister and filed cases against me of obstructing justice and grave misconduct and an act on becoming a public official. After that incident, I heard that Alex Kamia was the suspect of the murder of an ex-worker who was shut down inside his home and this ex-worker did not survive. I was scared to death when I heard this news. My option was to remain silent because killing could have actually happened when Kamiya and his group came to my place. There was also an ex-worker, Elsa Bolivar, who was a senior citizen, a woman shot dead while she was in her garden in Tagum City. I was so hysterical when pictures of her bullet-ridden body were sent to me. 
because he had just visited me in my place before it happened. Fear consumed me, and I remained silent. Three years ago, nagkausap po kami ni Alex Camia. Pumi po siya ng kapatawaran at nagsabi na siya ay nautusan lang po na kailangan din akong iligpit. Pinaniwala po siya na ako ay may malaking kasalanan at ako ay napakasamang babae. Nang tinanong ko kung ano ang aking kasalanan, sinabihan daw siya na tinukso ko raw si Apulo, Kayun Kibuloy. Nakiapid daw ako sa mga ministro. Narinig naman po ninyo yung sa video. Nakipagtalik daw ako mismo doon sa workers' house at nagnakaw daw ako ng 3 million pesos. He even said in Visaya, di ba nagtugot man ang ginoo pagpatay sa dautan? Doesn't God permit the killing of the wicked? Doon ko lang naintindihan na kailangang i-declare ni Apulo Kibuloy sa lahat ng mga workers at members na ako'y makasalanan at napakasamang babae para magiging makatwiran ang lahat ng parusa na binigay sa akin at magiging makatwiran din kung bakit ako kailangang patayin. Apulo Kibuloy called me Jezebel, the temptress. Using his pulpit to broadcast, to broadcast how filthy and evil I was. This became a pattern. Kung may mga workers na may alam sa kanyang buhay, sa sikritong, sikritong buhay, at aalis sa kanyang kingdom, sila ay akusahan na napakaraming kasalanan. He would always exaggerate their weaknesses. At ipaniwala sa mga workers at members na sila ay umalis dahil may mga marumi at mga, napakasama, at mga napakasamang mga tao. His followers only heard his side of the story, which was always filled with lies and twisted truths. They are their side, our side. Excuse me. Was never heard and was never allowed to be heard. They only believed whatever he fed them and even defended him and attacked those who defied their leader without investigating the truthfulness of the circumstances. Nakita naman po siguro natin kung paano siniraan ng mga workers at defenders ni Apulo Kibuloy ang mga testigo dito. Mga napakasamang descriptions para lang ipahiya ang mga nagsalita ng kanilang mga karanasan sa loob ng kanilang kingdom. Mga salitang hindi nababagay sa mga tinatawag na mga citizen ng kingdom of Jesus Christ. Their intention is only to demoralize and warn others of the consequences of defiance. Last August 2021, during one of his television programs, he once again maligned me, broadcasting nationally and internationally that I was a fornicator and an immoral woman, which we have just watched. Madam Chair, I would like to remind Mr. Kibuloy to remember the biblical stories about the lives of King Nebuchadnezzar, King Sennacherib, and King Herod. All of them fell into the hands of the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar you know that, was separated from his people and lived like a beast and ate grass for seven years. King Sennacherib died a tragic death murdered by his own sons. King Herod was struck by the angel of God, died, and his body was eaten by worms. Their sin was that they replaced God with themselves, considering themselves as gods and blaspheming the one true God. This is all, Madam Chair. Thank you.